Jesus' death right? Well, the scripture is right 100%. It's right all the time. Sometimes we have to do a little bit more study to understand what it's saying, but it's always right. Verse 26 says that Pilate put an inscription above. It says, And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And the Jewish leadership were unhappy about this. They didn't want that sign put above Jesus' head. But there's another passage where Pilate says, What I have written, I have written. He wasn't going to change it. Verse 27, and when they crucified two, and, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with Him also reviled Him. All of this is a fulfillment of Scripture. In the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, written 500 years before Jesus Christ would ever come onto the scene. Isaiah 53, verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. <clears throat> and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised, and we esteemed Him not. Right there, the Scripture tells us, this is going to happen to Christ. He is going to be put into death. He is going to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And He will be despised, and people will not esteem Him. One of the things I find amazing about Mark's Gospel is Mark chooses not to tell us about the conversion of the second man. If you've ever read Luke's narrative, I'm sure all of you have, Luke's narrative actually tells us that one of those men who were reviling Christ actually before his death repented and called upon him for salvation. That's an interesting story. I know John preached on that a few weeks ago, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I do want to just reference this. It's interesting. For me, it has always been interesting... Not that the man on the right called out for salvation. What's always been interesting to me is the amount of pride in the human heart and the one who just sat there and reviled Christ till his last breath. It's amazing to me the depth of our depravity, but also the grace of God that would open up the heart of the other man. And when the sixth hour had come, verse 33, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Imagine the fear of standing in midday. There is no electricity, there's no lights, and they did not have lights during the day as we do. They, they didn't need them because... They use the external light, the light of the sun. And imagine in midday everything going black for three hours. This was no normal solar eclipse. This was a supernatural blacking out of the sun. It was as if God Himself had taken His hand and placed it between the light of the sun and the people in response to how they had made a divide between themselves and His Son who was the light of the world. The geographical extent of this darkness is unknown. It's unknown if it was just over Palestine, but there are writers, early Christian writers, who say extended well beyond Palestine, that this darkness fell upon the world for three hours. And at this point in the darkness, Christ cries out. And entire books have been written on the subject of the seven things that he said but I just want to focus on the one thing that he said in verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?
It's not going to be on the screen, but I do want you to turn in your Bibles. I want to show you something. Turn to the book of Psalms. And go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22 begins with the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, most people, when they read that passage about Jesus crying out to His Father, My God, my God, most people don't even realize that Jesus there is quoting Scripture. He's giving a reference to this psalm. If time were permit, I would exegete the psalm, but I just want to reference the fact that this psalm begins with the question, Why have you forsaken me? And it ends with the promise that God protects and upholds His people. I reference that only for this reason. The eternal Son of God is crying out, having been forsaken by the Father. And why? For what purpose has God in His love and in His mercy turned His face away from His Son? He has done so because at that very moment, Jesus Christ on the cross bore in Himself the sin of every person who would ever believe on His name. In that moment, He became He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. At that moment, Jesus, who was perfection, became instead sin for us. And the wrath of God, which we deserve, was placed upon Him. Beloved, this is the point when Jesus, the night before, said, Father, if there be another way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Everybody thinks it's the cross. Everybody thinks Jesus did not want to go and be tortured. Jesus did not want to go and have the physical punishment. And it was the pain on the back, and it was the pain of the cross, and it was the timber, and it was the nails. That is not the cup Jesus was asking to be relieved from. It was the cup of the wrath of God that was being poured out upon Him. That was His concern. He said, Father, if there be another way, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not thy will, not my will, but thy, thy will be done. It is not the cross that Jesus feared, it was the very wrath of God which was poured upon him. We need to understand that. Because in that moment, Christ took God's wrath for us. For the wrath of God is being revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, Romans Chapter 1, verse 18. And Christ took the wrath for His people. And He cried out that psalm, Why have you forsaken me? The psalm with the promise that God, who has forsaken, does not desert His people. In a moment, Christ experienced the eternal torment for all who would believe. And you know what the sad commentary on that is? The people around him made fun of him. And some of the bystanders, verse 35, and some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. See, people heard him call out for Eloi and they said, Oh, he's calling for Elijah. Some felt compassion, but most, especially the religious leaders, held them back. Let's see. Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. And verse 37 says, And Jesus uttered with a loud cry and breathed out his last. And in Luke 23, it tells us what his last words were. It says in Luke 23, 46, it says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and, 